John, I'm the library director here. I've been the director for the last two and a half years, but I've been with the building almost 20. So, yes. So, <laughs> so uh, and we are happy to have uh, Mr. Cam back to do another program for us. She did CCC last year, and we're doing Iowa Field Chance tonight. So, without further ado. Thank you. Well, I very much stay, say I stumbled into all of this. I live in Shaw Rock, north of Waterloo. I didn't grow up there. So when we moved there, I got involved in genealogy and discovered I was descended from the founder of the Shaw Rock. And my mother and my grandmother did not know this. So about 15 years ago, we started a historical society in town. I got elected president. <laughs> And I'm still president. Well, with that, I didn't know Shell Rock's history. And I actually was the person that people were, were to bring things to to donate to the, light, to the museum. And so they'd come to my house and they'd go, this is from Coster, this is from Butler Center. And I'm going, why do we want these things? We're a Shell Rock Museum. Well, I finally asked somebody. And they said, oh, those are those towns that aren't there anymore. Butler Center was the county seat of Butler County for 20 years. And all that's there now is a cemetery. So I did a book for the museum that we called Where Did They Go? And it was about eight of these towns around Shell Rock. Well, a publisher came to me. They asked if I could put the, make it a countywide book and could we have a series. So that's what the lost books are. They're towns in those counties that aren't there anymore. And those are all up in the northeast corner. So unless you've got some connection, sorry. Um, but they were going to call those ghost towns. And I said, they're not ghost towns. They're cornfields and hayfields and cemeteries. So that's where we decided on the lost towns. Well, this publisher was from South Carolina. And so after the Butler County book, they asked if there was a bigger county in the state. <laughs> there were times I wasn't sure if they thought I was in Idaho or Indiana or where, you know. So I then did Blackhawk County. Well, when I was in Blackhawk County working, I was looking for a town by the name of Aladdin. Anybody ever heard of it? Yeah. I actually had a third grade boy tell me in the spring he knew where it was at. I didn't ask him. I was, I was between afraid what he would say and... So, I was at the Cedar Falls Historical Society trying to find this Aladdin, and they asked me if I had looked at the trolley. I said, what trolley? Well, there was an electric train that ran between Waverly and Cedar Rapids. Ran for over 50 years. I didn't know a thing about it. So, they went and got the schedule, and there was Aladdin. Okay, so it's a stop on the trolley. Well, as I'm researching more, it actually was the shipping department at John Deere. And there was a building on the John Deere works that still said Aladdin, Iowa. Nobody could ever tell me why they named it Aladdin versus John Deere. So, so I fell into the trolley book. Well, when the trolley book came out, I had changed publishers by that time. The Iowan has published about 10 of my books. The Iowan Magazine, they've been my publisher. So when the trolley book came out, I was up in Denver talking about the trolley book. It ran through Denver. And the ladies were telling me their Saturday night activity was to go to the depot. Oh, I left something out, sorry. After Prohibition, Every county voted to see if they were going to be wet or dry. Blackhawk County went dry. Yeah, I, every time I say that, I'm just like, really? <laughs> Bremer County, Waverly, was wet. So these men would ride the trolley from Waterloo to Denver to get their supplies. <laughs> so the, that was these ladies' activity when they were about 10 or 12, was to go to the depot on Saturday night and watch the men come in. And then they told me if they could stay late, like an hour later, it was even more fun after the men had spent an hour in the taverns. <laughs> well, when we finished up, 
their activity director came up to me and whispered in my ear what was prohibition. I about fell over. So I told her, and driving home I'm thinking, I wonder what my daughters know. My daughters are both Wartburg College graduates. They tell me I have to tell you they're not history majors. They knew Al Capone, they knew the Untouchables, they tried to put Bonnie and Clyde in there. And when I asked my teenage granddaughters what they knew, they said, prohibition of what? So of course, that was the next book. Well, when Prohibition came out, I was talking to a newspaper reporter, and he asked me what my next book was. And I said, I'm thinking the POW camps or the CCC camps. Well, his face was just blank. So I waited. He said, were the POW camps from the Civil War? <laughs> and he didn't know what the CCC was either. So I explained both to him. Well, I was ready to go with POWs about five years ago. I grew up around Waverly. Waverly had a camp. And so I had heard about it pretty much my whole life. So it would have been Thanksgiving of 2016. I'm at my daughter's talking with her mother-in-law. Her mother-in-law grew up around Waverly also. She's five years older than I am. She had never heard of this POW camp. So we're just sitting there trying to figure out why I knew about it and she didn't, that sort of thing. Our teenage granddaughters come up to us and say, what are you guys talking about? So we told them. The younger one who was 16 went, why didn't we learn this in school? I said, well, I would bet your teacher has no clue there was a POW camp three miles south of town. The older one who was in college went, well, he should. I said, I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> well, when I talked to my publisher, she said, if you're going to do CCC, you got to do it first, because it was first chronologically. So we went into it expecting to do two books, the east and the west part of the state. Well, again, I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> so as I got into it, there was so much more. The northeast and the southeast parts of the state are out. My central book for the CCC is at the publisher, and that will cover your area. No, let's see. I've got to think where I'm at. No, you'll be in the southeast. Uh, the central is Des Moines area. And then I'm working in the western part yet. But the POW kind of intruded, and I just had to do it. <laughs> I will tell you, I am now working on Rosie the Riveters from Iowa. I have spoke with 31 women who were Rosies. And the stories they could tell me are just unreal. They're not stuff I could make up, that sort of thing. So if you know someone, if you learn of someone, Marion and pretty much all the librarians know how to get a hold of me. So come in, tell them that you want to talk to me, that sort of thing, and they'll make it work. Because again, we've got to get these stories while we can. So back to the POWs. Well, of course, we entered the war in 41. By the spring of 42, England is saying to the U.S., you've got to take prisoners of war. We're out of room. Well, I didn't realize until I really got researching the Geneva Convention that these prisoners were supposed to be housed away from the fighting. So that's a big start to why they ended up in England and why they came here. So in 42, the U.S. took 100,000 POWs, mostly German, and they came on military boats. I'll pass this around. The military boats had take, been taking servicemen and supplies to Europe, and they had been coming back empty. Well, they began carrying prisoners back. In 42 already, these prisoners are fed K rations. They think they're wonderful. I mean, I've never eaten K rations, but all I've heard is not good about them. They thought they were great. They couldn't believe how much they were getting to eat. So in 42 already, there's a shortage of food in Europe. We were actually sending food to England before we got into the war. And again, I didn't realize that. I either slept through that day or something. <laughs> I didn't know there was a shortage of food in Europe. They say that Germany and Italy were so short of food that every time they needed food, they would invade a country. 
I don't know how much truth, but you know. So we get the prisoners started in 42. The first bunch mostly went to the southwest corner because, again, I think they didn't have to insulate buildings, you know. So they're going there. The U.S. government is realizing they can use these POWs for labor. And we've got this real shortage of labor. The guys are off fighting the war. On top of that, because of the war, because of the shortage of food, there was more demand for food going on. In Iowa, we were growing green beans, corn, peas, sugar beets, asparagus, and tomatoes. All were being grown here in Iowa. We had 36 canning factories within the state to can this food. So again, we're short of the workers in the fields and we're short of workers in the factories. So the government's looking at where they can put camps, that they can put these prisoners to work, and make use of them. So in 42 and into early 43, there's little blurps in the newspaper. There's strangers in town, and we don't know what they're doing. <laughs> you know, you used to know when there was a stranger in town. Well, at the same time, in 43, Eldora in central Iowa and Shenandoah down in southwest Iowa were both able to get Italian prisoners from Missouri. Missouri had POW camps by that time. So Eldora, they worked in the hemp fields and the hemp factories. Everybody knows why we grew hemp. Rope, right. We had 11 hemp factories in Iowa, and again, we needed this labor. At Shenandoah, it was a seed corn company that needed the work. And around Shenandoah, they still talk about um, having to teach these Italian prisoners to do tassel. Yeah, you know. So both of these groups of prisoners lived in CCC camps, which were wonderful, wooden buildings with stoves, all this sort of stuff. Again, the pr prisoners couldn't believe how well we were, we were treating them. So in 43, a, a farmer by Clorinda sees somebody in his cornfield cutting down corn. The farmer goes out, he says, what are you doing? The stranger won't answer him. The farmer calls the sheriff, the sheriff comes out, the f stranger tells the sheriff, it's a national emergency and that's all I can tell you. Well, the government ended up buying 200 acres from this same farmer but I still haven't figured out why they were cutting corn. Yeah. So by the end of summer of 43, the government buys 200 acres at Algona, up north central Iowa, and 200 acres at Clorinda. Both are going to be POW camps. Nobody around the towns know this is coming in it until it comes out in the newspapers. The POWs are coming. As you can imagine, there were some upset people. Some were frightened, some were angry. Some people were saying, why here? We don't need them, you know. And of course, there's the people that have sons that are POWs in Germany. So all this is going on. As soon as they can get workers into these fields with the harvest, they go to work. And these are private contractors that have made bids and got the contracts to build these buildings. So at the same time, the military had a real concern. There's going to be 3,000 prisoners in each camp. The most army military personnel there were at e either camp was 300. And many times it was 100. So the military had a real fear. These prisoners are somehow going to form a plot. If they overthrow the military, they get out to the town, What's going to happen? This sort of thing. So, when they build these camps, and these are just pictures of the camps. It does say on the back which camp it is. Both Algona and Clorinda were built with the same plans. And I think most of them in the U.S. were built with the same plans. So, they completely fenced the 200 acres. Double row of fencing, topped with barbed wire, surrounded with a minimum of eight guard towers, 
and there's machine guns in the guard towers with bullets. Then on the inside, there's three completely separate camps, and they're separated by more than a double's arm's length because they consciously don't want these prisoners passing notes or whatever. So they're not going to be able to pass something. And within it, these are completely independent camps. There's three hospitals, there's three mess kitchens, all of that. They're completely standalone. The prisoners are only going to be in one camp. They're not going to be able to go see Joe Blow over here. They're going to be in one camp. And the guards are only going to work in one camp because, again, they're just concerned about this socialization. So that was the military's concern. The local law enforcement were concerned that if a prisoner did get out, somebody was going to pick up a gun and shoot him. And then they were going to deal with that aftermath. So they <coughs> began holding meetings, and they held these meetings every other week in September, October, November. And according to the newspaper reports, they sound like many riots, <laughs> and maybe not many at times. Well, so when the people come in, first the law enforcement says, if you think you see a prisoner, he's going to have this uniform on that says PW. So if you see that, then we'll see if you see a guard with him. If there's a guard with him, leave him alone. They're doing whatever they're supposed to be doing. If you actually can't see a gun, a gun, sorry. <laughs> if you actually can't see a guard, go say halt to the prisoner. We are teaching all the prisoners that halt means literally freeze. They don't move a thing till we tell them they can. So you say halt, you go inside your house, you call the sheriff, that's all you do. This is what the law enforcement is really stressing. Then they say, we're going to do everything in our power to protect you. But you've got to do some stuff, too. If they get out, they're going to want out of these uniforms. Don't leave your clothes on the clothesline overnight. <laughs> yeah. If they get out, they're not going to have food. They're not going to have money to buy food. And it actually was a national law oh, that if somebody gave these prisoners cash money, they could be tried for treason. They did not want the prisoners to have money that they could bribe guards or whatever. So the prisoners aren't going to have money. They're going to need money for food. Pick up your garden produce. Don't leave stuff on the picnic table. You know, just that sort of stuff. Take the keys out of your car. Lock your doors. You know, normal stuff, but we all know they didn't do that in the 40s. So that's the first thing law enforcement starts. Then the military goes, we will be operating according to the golden rule. And I think that's about when the trouble broke out. And there were actually fistfights at these meetings. The military is trying to get across to people that they have a reason for this. But it sounds like trouble started right in that area. They were saying to the crowd, we are doing what we said we would do when we signed this Geneva Convention. We are operating as we said we would. Well, you know, there's people going, Germany isn't doing that, why should we? Da, you know, da da da. The, then the military is telling them, we are doing this because we hope the prisoners will write their families and tell them how well they're being treated. And the prisoners did do that. I saw a letter from a prisoner that said, don't send us any food. We eat more in a day than we ate in a week at home. <laughs> yeah. So we're hoping the prisoners will write their families. Then we're hoping somehow their families will go to the military there and things will improve for our prisoners. Well, that part didn't work out so well. But by the same token, I was able to talk to two American soldiers that had been POWs in Germany. And like pretty much every time you hear something, the first guy I went to see, I had been told he was over six feet tall and weighed 105 pounds when he got home. You know, just like we always heard. So as we're talking, I said to him, 
so you were starved. He goes, no, we weren't. I'm, I'm kind of speechless. <laughs> so he says, we had as much to eat as the guards did. They just plain didn't have food. So we talked some more. So I went to see the second guy. So I started out, were you starved? He goes, no, we had as much to eat as the guards' families did. And he said, they just didn't have food. So I said, okay, I always heard about your care packages be, being stolen. He starts laughing. He says, oh, they took the packages, but they gave us half of it, and we would have given them half of it. <laughs> so yeah, I very much know that the Japanese mistreated our prisoners. I very much know some of the camps were this way. But these guys were at two different camps, and they completely denied being mistreated. So there we go again. But the shortage of food in Germany and Italy is a big part of what, everything that went on. So, like I said, these meetings went on all fall. By December, the camps are ready for occupancy. Both Algona and Clorinda had an open house, invited everybody. Come in, see what we're doing, ask your questions. We want you to know what we're doing. At the same time, there were rumors going around the state, and they even got in the newspapers. The first big rumor was, evidently there was a shortage of food, a shortage of beer for the average citizen. Yeah, good thing it wasn't food, or it wasn't beer, you know. Anyway, there was a shortage of beer for the average citizen. Comes out in the newspaper, the prisoners are going to get beer. Well, you know how that went over, and all the talk and all of that. The second rumor dealt was the same thing with cigarettes. The prisoners were going to get cigarettes. Well, a reporter from the Des Moines Register really chased these rumors down. He went all over the state covering it. The beer rumor started when a delivery man delivered beer to one of these camps and then went around telling everybody the prisoners were going to get beer. When this reporter went to the camp, it was in the military canteen, not the prisoner's canteen, you know. And the same with the cigarettes. So this is a big part of what the military was trying to find out. What's the problems? What are your concerns? That sort of thing. Again, there were fist fights at these open houses, that sort of thing. The first German prisoners arrived in Iowa in January of 44 and they came into Algona. At Algona, the depot for the train was like a mile from the camp. And it had been decided they were gonna walk the prisoners this mile. So a lady calls me. What I do is I send newspaper releases out to all the newspapers in the state. You see them, huh? I don't know where they get in, but I get phone calls and that's what it's about. And I just plain say, I'm looking for information on this. You know. So a lady from Algona calls me, and she said she saw this first group of prisoners. She was 10 years old, riding in a car with her mother, and she said all of a sudden there's a guy standing in front of the car pointing a gun at us. And he says, you can't go any further. 10 years old. She said she looked out the windshield, and as far as she could see, it's lined with military and guns. You know, they're transferring these prisoners. She says to me, I don't think I'll ever forget all that military and guns in Algona, Iowa. You know, just like all of us. Well, the prisoners got to camp, and again, it had been decided nationwide that the commanders of the camp were going to welcome every group of prisoners, irregardless of whatever time they arrived, day or night. They were going to welcome them. Well, this really impressed the German prisoners. They couldn't believe the commander had time for them, sort of thing. And I think some of the stuff we did was just plain a PR issue. So the commander comes in, he welcomes them, he explains no work, no eat. And this is from the Geneva Convention. Enlisted men had to work if they were asked to. If they refused, they would get bread and water. Simple as that. So this is all explained to the prisoners. They're sent to their barracks for the night. 
They come out in the morning, they have breakfast. The first thing that goes on is they're separating out all the hardcore Nazis, the Gestapo, the SS. They're going into one of these camps and they're not coming out. They're not going to do any work because they can't be trusted. They're in this camp until they go home. Um, the, the Nazis have killed other German prisoners in other states already. They were working for the enemy, and so they would kill them. Now, I have been asked recently, so I'll just throw it in. They would first look, evidently some of them were tattooed behind the ear. So they would check that out. If they, that didn't tell them anything, they would say something derogatory about Hitler or the SS or something, and these hardcore ones are going to start arguing and fighting and that sort of thing. And that's how they got thrown in this prison that they're not getting out of. You know, the regular prisoners aren't going to argue. They're not going to defend Hitler, that sort of thing. And what really, mostly what we had in Iowa were draftees or men forced to enlist. A, a prisoner we had had been a doctor in Germany, and he wrote about this. He said he criticized Hitler one day. The next day, the SS was at his house and said, if you don't enlist, we're killing your family. So he enlisted. He then wrote the happiest day of his life was the day he was taken prisoner. He was going to live through the war then, you know. And so this is what most of the prisoners in Iowa felt like. They were very pleased to be here working. They felt like they were contributing by helping with the harvest, helping with the canning. They knew it was going to end up in Europe and it might help their families, sort of thing. So the first thing is they're separating the Nazis. The second thing is, then they, all the medical personnel, and there was a doctor in each of these camps, the three camps and a hospital. So, every German prisoner is getting a full medical exam. And again, the prisoners can't believe this. They didn't get that in Germany. Well, as I'm reading this, I'm kind of going, so I don't, I'm, I'm missing something. I was an RM, and all of a sudden it clicked with me. They were checking to see if these prisoners had been vaccinated. Because, you know, somebody comes in with something and the whole camp gets it and then the whole town gets it. Most of these German prisoners had had no vaccinations. Most of them had to have three shots, smallpox, tetanus, and TB. And again, there were letters written home that we cared so much about them, we gave them shots so they wouldn't get sick. Yeah. Like I said, the PR we gave for ourselves. The third thing was an inventory of private possessions, and that's what the military called it. Well, again, as I'm reading stuff, it kind of clicks with me. They're looking for weapons, and they did find pocket knives. And so any pocket knives, anything that could be used as a weapon was put in an envelope with the prisoner's name on it, and they would get it back when they went home. But, you know, again, one of these prisoners wrote home and said he could not believe with what respect his private possessions were treated. You know? So this is all going on in the beginning days of the camp. Well, both Algoma and Clorinda were seed corn companies and they were wanting prisoners, needing prisoners. Well, there was one other thing that had to be sorted out. What was the factory going to pay the government for the prisoners? And the Geneva Convention says it has to be similar to civilian wages. So it's decided the factories, farmers, whoever, are going to pay 50 cents an hour for each prisoner working. This goes to the government. The prisoners are going to get 10 cents an hour for canteen tokens. Like I said, they can't have money, so they get canteen tokens. Now some of them, would ha have a savings account. If they didn't think they were going to go to the canteen, they could have a savings account and that would be given to them when they left. But we've got that 40 cents an hour difference. The camp at Algona, the camp at Clorinda, don't pay attention to my hands, I have to do that to think. I don't know why. <laughs> Plus 157 more main 
camps in the United States each cost a million dollars to build in 1944 dollars. We had 159 main camps here in the U.S. Every state but three had POWs. Nevada, North Dakota, and Vermont did not have POWs. Every other state had them. We had about 465,000 POWs in the U.S. We had about 25,000 in Iowa. So that's where the 40 cents went. So, the prisoners are sent out to work. They go out, eight prisoners with one guard. The guard does have a gun. It does have bullets, this sort of thing. And again, the military is still concerned about this plot they think is going to happen. Well, one day one of the prisoners says, where are we going if we got out? <laughs> and little by little, <coughs> things did loosen up. You know, as they got to know each other and this stuff. And like I said, most of them were not... Most of them did not want to go back to Germany or even Europe. They knew what was going on. They were safer here, this sort of thing. Now, there were a group of prisoners that had this idea that if they could get out, disappear is what they called it. If they could disappear, stay hidden until after the war, then they hoped they could bring their families here. And nationwide, about 20 disappeared. Well, after the war, most of them came forward because they couldn't get a job. They didn't have birth certificates. They didn't, couldn't get social security cards, this sort of thing. So most of them did turn themselves in and were sent back. So with that said, there were a couple escapes. A guy got out of Clorinda. He thought he was going to Mexico. He got to Missouri and got caught. That was the end of that one. <laughs> Algonas are very interesting. The first one I found in a newspaper, and the, the prisoners were counted morning and night. So at one of the counts, they're short a prisoner. They know they're short a prisoner. For whatever reason, they can't figure out who it is. And evidently, the prisoners didn't help, it, help with that. Surprise! <laughs> So, the newspaper article ends with, there's a prisoner out there, they don't know who, but, you know, be alert, this sort of thing. So, two, three days later, when the next paper comes out, it then says, the prisoner has been found. He was found at his girlfriend's house. <laughs> well, I'm going, how did he get a girlfriend? So, I was up by Algona. And I said to a group, I don't understand how he got a girlfriend. Well, somebody in the crowd, and she did look old enough, she said, oh, I can tell you. She said, the one fence at Algona was on the top of a gully. And in her words, we sat in that gully for hours every day talking to the prisoners. So you think your teenage daughter's at school, do you? <laughs> I told Danica this lately. She's 12. I told my 12-year-old granddaughter, next time you get in trouble, tell your mom that you were just talking to the prisoners. <laughs> my daughter called me the other day while I was driving, and I thought, oh no, here it comes. <laughs> but evidently, Danica hasn't used it yet. So that was the first escape. The second escape was interesting also. Two guys tunneled out. They partly filled it in so they didn't look like somebody went through it. They walked to West Bend, 15 miles from Algona, turned themselves into the marshal, and they were back in camp before anybody knew they were missing. <laughs> well, I can't say for sure what the commander said, but I have the feeling it was blankety blank, 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 what were you thinking? Because supposedly the prisoner said, we told you we could get out if we wanted to. We just didn't want to. Oh. Yeah. And it sounds like that's what happened. They became friendly rivals, teenage boys acting up, whatever, you know. Um, around both Algona and Clorinda, there was a large German population. Many of the farmers could still speak German. And many were first generation. Now, the prisoners had their own translator. We had translators. 
But again, as they're going out to the farms, they're able to talk to many of these farmers. So, of course, the farmers are wanting them, needing them. Now, the farmers around Algona and Clorinda, if they were hooked up with these factories, the seed corn companies, they could get their prisoners through there, and that was taken care of. The people that weren't customers of the seed corn companies, they had to go through the extension office, and there was just more hoops to jump through. So, it seems like the mothers weren't excited about getting prisoners. And again, I got phone calls about this. Evidently, several prisoners just stared at the kids as they were playing. And that, of course, unnerved the mothers, wondered what was going on. Well, finally, one of the prisoners said to her mother, I have a little girl that exact age, and I've never seen her. They were dads. Well, I got a phone call from Algona. The lady said her mom was just determined they were not getting prisoners. The father's saying, we need them. I can't make my quota, this sort of thing. Well, the fin mother finally gave in. And remember, this is a German grandma. So she says, first, I'm not cooking for them. The father says, you have to. That's part of the agreement. The, grand the mother thought a little bit. She goes, I'm not using my good china. <laughs> <laughs> well, then the daughter that called me said the mother's sister was a nurse in England taking care of servicemen. The sister's husband was a POW in Germany. You know, there's always more to the story. I got a call from Southwest. And the guy says to me, his mother was just petrified of the prisoners. She didn't want them. She didn't want them anywhere near. The father said, okay, they wouldn't get prisoners. The neighbor got prisoners. So every time the prisoners came, she would pull all the curtains, lock all the doors, and the guy that called me said, if we got caught peeking out a curtain, we were in a world of hurt. I said to him, did you ever ask her why she was so afraid? He goes, no. <laughs> well, the people I spoke with, I did ask them about that. And remember, most of them were 10, 12 years old at that time. And they talked about having piggyback rides. They talked about having books read to them. Some of them still had something that the prisoners might have made them, and they were still protecting, guarding, that sort of thing. None of them admitted to ever being concerned about the prisoners. So things are going well. This is getting into the fall of 44. An interesting thing happens. The teenage boys in the southwest corner of the state began putting PW on their clothes. And I found this in the newspaper because the, the police, the military, everybody's begging these kids to t take it off. You could get shot. <clears throat> All this sort of thing. It goes across and it's in northwest Missouri. These boys are putting PW on their shirts. And like I said, every newspaper's got, take that off, you could get shot. All this. It took the cold weather for them to put a coat on to stop it. So, the rest of the states wanting prisoners, needing prisoners. Well, there was a little hang-up with that, too. The government's not going to build more <coughs> of these camps. But the Geneva Convention says that the prisoners and the guards have to be housed similar. So if the guards have hot running water, the prisoners have to have it. If the guards have mattresses, the prisoners have to have it. So it's decided that these companies that are going to have the prisoners come out have to provide housing for them. And the, the housing has to be similar. So to me, it's real interesting oh, to see where they ended up, where they lived, and who they worked for. I'm going to pass this around quick. Every prisoner had to wear this. It was a cardboard tag, and you can see the holes. And notice that it's in other languages at the bottom. If they didn't have that on, they could not have wheels. So, so, this is a map of where the Algona camp sent prisoners, and I'll send this around. 
But notice they're up in Minnesota, they're up in North Dakota, just all over the state. Now, Clorinda sent them all over too. And we had 18 of these branch camps within the state. So we had two main camps and about 18 of these branch camps within the state. Now, do notice the northeast corner. The camps at Charles City, at Waverly, and it goes over to Clinton. Nowhere in this northeast corner has POW camps. Well, again, I went up there and I said to them, did you guys have seed corn companies or canning factories? And they went, no. I said, I think that's why you didn't have POWs then. So, over here at Audubon, they lived at a roller rink. The military would come in and fence whatever it was, and then they lived there. They worked for a seed corn company. At Tabor, down in southwest Iowa, they lived in a college dorm. And again, it was a seed corn company. Now, the uh, college dorm, the CCC camps, those might stay there over the winter because they could be heated. But most of these other camps, they couldn't be heated, so they were a summer-fall camp and they went back to Algona or Corinda for the winter. Um, West Liberty had camps. They lived at the fairgrounds. That was another seed corn company. Muscatine had camps. They lived at a DNR building that had been a fish hatchery. And they worked for the Heinz Company, canning tomatoes. Well, I got, I got a call, phone call from that area. And this guy said that his dad had raised tomatoes and took them to the plant. And he said, in school, and again, I heard this all over the state, in school, they had been taught to cover and hide, you know, because the Germans are monsters. Well, this guy goes with, with his father to the Heinz Company in Muscatine, and he sees these guys with PW on their shirts. So he says to his dad, what's that? Oh, those are the prisoners of war. And this guy tells me, he said, I just was shocked. They looked like us. They were monsters. And like I said, I've heard that from all over the state. Roughly this 10, 12 year age, they really took it to heart. Um, Wapalo had a camp, and that was a seed cord company. This is Schick Hospital at Clinton. Anybody know the, that? I'm not close enough yet. I didn't know about it either. Um, the thing was, Schick Hospital was a rehab hospital. It was over 10 blocks square. Had an indoor pool. It was the fourth hospital built for rehab in the US. So I read in the newspaper, the Germans are going to be housed on the grounds of Schick Hospital. And I'm kind of going, what, you know? Well, they came in, they fenced an area, they put tents up, the guards and the prisoners lived in the tents, the prisoners did janitorial work in the hospital. I made a trip over to Clinton because I really, I went to the historical society and talked to people. There was never any problems between the prisoners and the soldiers. In fact, they say the soldiers came to respect the prisoners because they were doing what they had to to protect their families, sort of thing. I got a phone call from a guy that he said, these German prisoners wanted to learn to speak English so bad, he said, and we had to walk by the camp every day after school. He said, they learned if they gave us a candy bar, we'd stop and talk to them. <laughs> and then he tells me that he and some of his friends <coughs> were carrying guns because they were going hunting after school. That's what they ate. So he said one day he laid his gun down and he was busy getting his candy bar and all of a sudden he hears, pick up that gun you little SOB or I'm shooting you. He said he picked up his gun and ran. And he said it took him two days to go back and get his candy bar. <laughs> then the interesting thing was he said he and his wife made a trip to Germany, a tour, you know. So they had shirts on that said Clinton, Iowa. He said, we lost track of the amount of men that came up to us and said, I was a prisoner of war in Clinton. Thank you for how you treated us. So Clinton had another camp. It was Italians. They lived just in a city park in tents. 
They worked at the Pillsbury Company. I didn't even know we had these companies. Waverly had a camp. It was at the YWCA south of town. The prisoners and the guards did not live in the barracks. It was a wooden buildings all around. There was not enough room for the prisoners and the guards in the barracks. So they lived in tents. They fenced the area. The prisoners and guards lived in tents. They used the showers. They used the mess kitchen. They did not use the barracks. Well, I was able to talk to a guy. Oh, and those prisoners worked for Marshall Canning Company. I was able to talk to a guy that lived right next to the prison camp. He was 15 years old when these prisoners arrived. And he actually worked at Marshall Canning also. And so one of the first things he said to me was, you do know they only fenced three sides of that camp. <laughs> well, I did know that because this is real close to my house. And again, growing up, I knew where this was. The fourth side was along the river. And so I said to him, well, you know, if I didn't know where a river was going, I wouldn't necessarily get into it. He goes, you can wade across. <laughs> oh, well, most of the time you can, yeah. Well, then he tells me, at this camp, they had an in-ground in swimming pool. The commander refused to let the prisoners swim in it, for whatever reason. Did I tell you the about the Muscatine? Okay, at Muscatine, at the Fish Hatchery building, they had a lake on the grounds. They were allowed, the prisoners were allowed to swim in that lake. There's all kinds of blurb in the newspapers about the prisoners contaminating the water. <laughs> so, up at Waverly, in an in-ground pool, they refuse, they can't swim in the pool. But this guy is then telling me that he and his friends went around the fence and went swimming about every night, watched by the prisoners. <laughs> you know, so go figure again. So, things are going well. They're making their quotas. The prisoners are doing well. Uh, I did notice a real difference. In the southwest corner, they were treated much more lenient than at Algona and the eastern part. I know at Waverly, it was very much known that if you drove by the camp, they would stop every car that went by the camp. And if you didn't have a reason for being there, supposedly they turned your name into the FBI. Supposedly. You know, I don't know. But down at Algona, or sorry, down at Clorinda, they could ask for the same prisoners every day. They would get them, you know, they'd get to know them, all this sort of thing. It got to the point they could even ask them to come for Sunday dinner, and they would come without guards. So, you know, there was a real difference in how they were treated. Well, things are going well. All of a sudden, all the German prisoners at Clorinda are moved to Algona. Algona's got close to 7,000 prisoners, and Clorinda's sitting there empty. Nobody knows what's going on. Well, again, it finally comes out in the newspaper, the Japs are coming. They were getting Japanese prisoners of war at Clorinda. Well, they weren't welcomed like the Germans had been. And in fact, or farmers around that area actually went to the camp and said to the commander, I won't have Japs working in my field, that sort of thing. So they actually brought in twice as many guards. They brought in guard dogs. The problem was these prisoners were not supposed to be alive. The Japanese were supposed to commit suicide rather than be taken prisoner. And so these prisoners were considered dead to their families, to the government, that sort of thing. Mm. So the guards and the military doesn't know what's going to happen. You know, are we going to get any work out of them? What's going to happen? So they bring the prisoners in. The commander welcomes them. He explains no work, no eat. They're sent to the barracks for the night. It snows. So the prisoners come out in the morning. They're told, as soon as you clean the sidewalks and the roads, you can have breakfast. The prisoners went, no, we're not doing that. We don't have to do that. They stood there all day in the cold. And when they went back to the barracks that night, they got bread and water. 
Well, the guards are caution. They're going to try to make deals with you overnight. Be prepared. Who knows? So the prisoners come out in the morning. Before anything is said, one of the prisoners says, as soon as we have breakfast, we'll clean the roads and the sidewalks. The guards go, no. <laughs> and they stood there all that day in the cold and had bread and water. On the third day, a few of the prisoners went to work. Now, they got to go to the mess kitchen and have full meals, that sort of thing. The rest of them continued to get bread and water in their, door, in their barracks. Every day, a few more prisoners would go to work. It took 10 days to get all the prisoners working in that instance. And they claim at any one time, about 40% of the prisoners were just refusing to work. They had nothing to gain from it. They had nothing to lose. You know. They didn't expect to go home. When the National Red Cross, or the International Red Cross, came out and inspected all these camps and talked to the prisoners, the pris Japanese prisoners refused to let the Red Cross notify their families they were alive. They would embarrass their families. They didn't expect to go home. It's kind of interesting, though. They did, claim, did complain about the food. <laughs> they didn't like sauerkraut. <laughs> Of course, the cooks were trying to get rid of the sauerkraut left from the Germans. And it actually, the guards actually had to go fishing and try to catch carp for the prisoners. Well, they did figure out something the Japanese would do. They would work in these garden nurseries, like Earl May Nursery. There was like a six of them down in that area at the time. And so these prisoners went out. They did good work. The, the owners were happy with it, all this sort of thing. The reporter from the Des Moines Register went over and covered it. And his story begins, <clears throat> what are we going to do with a thousand dead men when the war is over? You know, the military, those in command, had to be questioning what we're going to do. Because these prisoners don't figure they're going home. They're dead. Supposedly, some of the families had had funerals already. So things are moving along. The Germans have the idea they're losing the war for the most part. And again, I heard all over the state, they would say to a farmer, to a guard even, will you hide us? Will you let us stay? This guy in Waverly said they asked him if they could live in the barn and work for nothing if he'd let them stay. And he, he this many years later, he seemed sad he couldn't do something, you know. And many of the people that called me, I could hear in their voices, they wished they could have done something. Now, most of them did say, when you get home and you need something, you let us know. We will send it. And many, many of the prisoners did stay in contact. And many people talked about sending lard to the prisoners. They asked for coffee and lard. Hmm. I can understand coffee. I'm still having trouble with the lard. <laughs> it's yeah. <laughs> well, I even wondered, my dad used to talk about lard sandwiches. Uh, just calories, I think. Yeah. So, of course everybody's up in the air about Japan. Germany surrenders, the German prisoners celebrate just like the Americans. They're going home. They live through the war. Everybody's waiting on the Japanese. Finally, Japan surrenders. The guards are told they may all be dead in the morning. We don't have a clue. Well, they were alive. There was really no reaction from the Japanese prisoners. It took about four days before one of the prisoners said to a guard, the emperor surrendered so we can go home now. You know, they worked it out, that sort of thing. So we got them out of here as fast as we could. They went to California, and they did spend some time picking fruit there, and then they went home. Now, what, what I didn't tell you was, this was the only camp of Japanese enlisted POWs in the nation. The officers were at Fort McCoy, Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. And again, this is the only time they separated the officers from the enlisted men. And I think that had to do with the hopes that they could get the enlisted men to work. But those were the only two places to have Japanese POWs. And no one seems to know how they decided on these places. So um, 
from what I could find, what the people at Corinda knew, none of these prisoners ever came back. From what we could find, they went home, they were accepted by their families, you know, the emperor surrendered, so it was okay, they had. And it was just like over and done with, I guess. None of the prisoners ever came back, they never wrote anyone, they never made any kind of contact again. So, the peace accord has it spelled out that all these prisoners in the United States are supposed to go home through France and spend six months working in France before they go to their home country. Well, the people in Iowa, we were sending food to Germany by this time. So the people in Iowa know that this harvest of 45 is coming, and if we don't have these POWs to help with the harvest and this sort of thing, people are going to starve. Simple as that. So they were able to hang on to all these prisoners through that harvest, and most of ours went home in 46. By July of 46, <coughs> all of the prisoners were gone. And I very much, was, it was stressed to me, everybody went home in Iowa. Now, I had to do some rethinking on my part, because again, as a kid growing up in the 50s in Waverly, there was this guy that I swear I was told every Saturday night he was a POW and he stayed. Well, you know, you believe it, you accept it. Well, for whatever goofy reason, my kindergarten class had a reunion. I never heard of one. <laughs> anyway, I said to him, do you guys remember that guy in Waverly? Oh yeah, he was a POW. Everybody remembered it. None of us have any proof. The historical society has nothing. The newspapers have nothing. I'd like to know the guy's story. I don't think he was a POW, but again, you know, there we go. Um, I got a phone call from Clorinda. The guy says to me, you need to talk to so-and-so's daughter. He was a POW, and he stayed. Well, of course, I'm questioning it. I called Clorinda and talked to the guy. When I got him on the phone and told him what I wanted, he got real upset, and he got loud. What are we supposed to do? That man was a Russian POW, and he immigrated. And he says, we had him on the radio several times telling his story. It's in the newspaper. And yet, this rumor is still going around. Well, the interesting thing was, I was up at Charles City this spring, north of Waterloo. A guy comes up to me and tells me the same exact story about Clorinda. And I said to him, I, let me give you the name of this person to call in Clorinda. I think you're a little mixed up, maybe. I said, well, I was told he was a Russian POW, this sort of thing. This guy tells me I'm wrong. Thing was, he was only in his 30s, you know? And I gave him the number, I'll bet it didn't call. <laughs> From what I could find, what the people at Algona and Clorinda say, there were no marriages, there were no babies, no POW state in Iowa, that sort of thing. And again, I have been told several times, my aunt married a POW, and he stayed. And with them, I would say, well, check the years. I think, you know, there might be something there. So, what do we have to show from this? Well, at both Albona and Clorinda, the buildings were moved down around Carroll, and they were for returning servicemen. Two families would live in one of these barracks buildings. And they thought it was wonderful, you know, it was a great place to live. The land where these buildings were in Clorinda and Algona, both were given to the city, and both cities put their airports there. So if you go to Algona or Clorinda, look for the airport. That's where the POW camp is. was. The only building still standing is in Eldora. And again, this was a CCC building, and then the POW. And somebody was smart enough to say, we need to preserve this building. And they have. They've done a very nice job. It's actually a CCC POW museum. And they have a lot of original stuff there. Whereas Algona and Clorinda, they had great big auctions. Kitchen auction, everything went. You know, furniture, all of that. So they have very little original stuff at those places. Um, the Muscatine Art Gallery. 
has all kinds of things, pictures, pottery, tables, chairs, dressers, that these POWs made, and that art gallery has collected it, and it's really fantastic to see. Now, most of the museums in the state are trying to get people to donate their stuff because they think they can preserve it. Well, I'm a museum person, so okay, but after a couple of the stories I heard, yeah, I got a phone call from Charles City. They had a jeweler in Charles City. The guy that called me, his grandfather had been a guard at the camp. The jeweler made the grandmother's wife's wedding ring. Well, that's still within that family. He wouldn't give me his name at all. I got a phone call from the Southwest. This guy wouldn't even tell me what town he was from. He said his grandparents had POWs. They got so close to one of the POWs, they called him their German son. Their son was in Europe fighting. All they had was just a billfold picture of this son. The prisoner enlarged it, colored it. Their son didn't come home. Well, again, I, I have no problem with those st things staying with those families. And I really think there's more out there that people aren't talking about, you know, that sort of thing. But there is some stuff. This is from Audubon, where they lived at the roller rink. This is real big. It's fairly big. It's made out of little pieces of wood that are fitted and colored. I mean, it's fantastic. The picture doesn't do it justice at all. This still hangs in the, in the Carlson Seed Corn Company offices. The daughter brought it to the library there for me to see, and it was going right back. On the back it says, To Elmer Carlson from and the prisoner's signature had faded. We couldn't read it. So that's there. This is from the Clorinda Museum. And there's like eight or six, six or eight of these that, that were done of different views. And again, they're fantastic. These German prisoners wanted to be busy. And they asked for stuff. One of the first things the prisoners in Algona asked for was instruments. And they had a band. And they gave concerts. That sort of thing. This is from the Algona Museum, again, done by the prisoner. Now, do you know about the nativity at Algona? Yeah. Some of you? Okay. The backstory to me is wonderful. The prisoner came in in 44. He'd been wounded. He had to have surgery. He got infected. He just had all kinds of problems. He finally was dis declared disabled. He did not have to work. So as Christmas of 44 is coming, the prisoners are very excited. They get to celebrate Christmas. They haven't been allowed to celebrate Christmas in Germany. So this prisoner builds just a little cradle. They call it Jesus' crib, and they celebrate it around it. Well, the commander comes in in January of 45, and he calls this prisoner in. This prisoner had been an architect in Germany. So he's got sketched out all kinds of pieces of paper of what he wants to do for Christmas of 45. And they are the nativity. So the commander's looking at these pieces of paper. The, there's 20 statues in the grouping. They're about three quarter life size. The commander's looking at the pages and he goes, you're going to have to find a way to pay for this. The U.S. government is not paying for this. The, the materials, plaster, wire, and wood to build it cost $8,000 in 1945 dollars. Just the materials. The prisoners used their canteen funds to pay for it. Mm -hmm. They completely paid for the materials. So this prisoner and three or four others who were also disabled spent the whole year building this nativity. On weekends or at nights, some of the other prisoners might help out, but these four or five did most of the work. So it's Christmas of 45. The nativity is ready to be seen. These prisoners come back to the commander, and they say, we would like to invite the town of Algona 
as a thank you, thank you for how we've been treated. So they make arrangements. Thousands of people show up. I got a phone call from a lady who said she was there that first night. Then she told me she probably didn't remember it because she was five years old. <laughs> and she told me what she did remember was everybody was trying to get her to sit on this guy's lap who looked like Santa Claus. She said she finally sat on his lap and she said it was years later when her mom told her that was the guy in charge of the nativity. And of course they have no pictures, you know. So, in 46, the prisoners begin going home. They come back to the commander and they say, we would like to leave the nativity here, but we have a couple stipulations. Number one, it has to stay in Algona. Number two, you can't charge admission for it. So it's still in Algona. It's at the fairgrounds. It's got its own separate building. The Methodist men are in charge of it. I talked with the guy that's in charge. And he said, we're doing everything in our power to help our children and our grandchildren understand why we do this, why it's important, all of this sort of thing, and why it has to stay here. He said, we have been offered hundreds of thousands of dollars for it. And he said, we're doing our best and it's going to stay right here. It's the only thing like it done by the prisoners in the U.S. In the 80s, the school kids in Algona raised money to bring this prisoner back to Algona. The prisoner and his wife came back, and the commander and his wife came back. And they went around, the two men went around and spoke to all these school kids, kindergarten on up. The prisoner said something real similar to, we arrived here at the darkest days of our life. You gave us light. We came as enemies. We left as friends. I got one more story for you. Eldora was another place where the prisoners were treated very leniently. Again, they could go for Sunday dinner, this sort of thing. So again, one of their prisoners came back. A lot of these prisoners have come back, and they brought their children and their grandchildren. This guy in Waverly says he's had at least six come back. Knock, knock, knock. Remember me? This is my family. They want their families to see where they were at. So anyway, this guy in Eldora comes back and he said he lived in East Berlin after the war and during the Cold War. And he said, you know, we didn't know if we were all going to wake up in the morning. We didn't know if we were all going to be alive at night. He said, I gathered my family. I said to him, if we have to run, if we get separated, we will reunite at Eldora, Iowa. To me, those two stories about say it all, that doing the right thing is the right thing, that sort of thing. Now, there's a lot of scholars out there that say the U.S. treatment of the POWs hastened the end of the war. And why they say that is brought home by what happened at Algona. At Algona, the German prisoners arriving at the end of the war with 13 and 14 year old boys. And of course they're malnourished, their uniforms hang on them. And they told the nurses, and the nurses wrote about it, that if they found out they were fighting Americans, they laid their weapons down and surrendered. They wouldn't surrender to the Russians or the French, but the British or the Americans, they would lay their weapons down. Because they knew they would be treated better here than they were treated in their own country. So again, our treatment of the POWs hastened the end of the war. Questions, comments? Anything? Yeah. Um, by establishing the uh, prisoner war camps here in the Midwest, where they try and do get them geographically away from yeah. the coast? They didn't want them very close to the ocean, but, you know, New York, Virginia, they all had camps. Now, probably I would guess they'd be a certain ways in from the coast, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the the, some of the uh, reasons they looked for camps were away from the coast, away from the borders, um, on train rails, on a railway system, and somewhere where they could work. 
because there were prisoners that worked in northern Minnesota doing logging. There were prisoners that worked in the south picking cotton, you know. And, and again, they had to deal with black people down there. And again, they were kind of <coughs> woke up to it and such. So, yeah, they very much, they could not be near armament plants. They could not be near military bases, you know, this sort of thing. So, anything else? Talked about the fighting at the, 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 the beginning. You know, a lot of people during that time had lost their nurse. Their sons were yeah. in Europe and, and many people lost their sons. Right. And those are the ones that were very upset. Oh, yeah, probably. You know, because again, the, I actually had an interesting happening. I was down talking to the DAR in Marshalltown, and this little lady comes up to me. I would guess in the 90s, but you know, you know, people either look old or young to me. <laughs> so she comes up to me, and I'm just standing there, and she goes, "So did you find out how much we hated the POWs?" And I'm just floored, you know. I I heard nothing like that, and she's going on about this, and I said, "Did you live near one of these camps?" She goes, "Yeah, I live right near Eldora," and again. I mean, you know, that's completely different. I actually contacted the Eldora Museum and told them this, and they said they have heard, never heard anything like this. Well, this lady, she called herself a war widow. Her husband was in Europe fighting, and, and supposedly there were others in the neighborhood. They could see how well these prisoners were being treated, and in her words, these prison, the, their husbands were fighting for their homeland. And they were over here taking it easy and not suffering. I said, well, you know, they're fighting for our freedom, too. You know, that sort of thing. And there was no talking to her. And I wish I had got her name, because I know the person in, in Eldora Museum would love to hear this story. That's the only person I have really heard come out. And I mean, her husband came home, you know. So, but again, this is the only place I've run into somebody being that open. Now, I can't say. I've never heard anything bad in Algona or Clorinda. So, yeah. Did you have a question? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Um, we came in kind of late. Uh, I believe you said possibly your next book or somewhere down the line you're going to uh, do something on the growth of the river. Right. Uh, I worked at the packing plant in Otumwa uh, when I was going to college. Uh -huh. And on one of my tours there, I worked with a group of ladies who worked there during World War II. Uh -huh. And that was interesting oh, to listen yeah. to them. Uh -huh. uh, because basically, uh, they worked there through the entire war. Uh -huh. And then when the war was over, the plant management said, oh, well, you guys can go home now. Yeah. And they said, we are not going yeah. home. And, and were, they got there to stay? A, there was a strike and a conflict, and yeah. they really had to fight to keep their jobs. Um, would you take one of my cards and write that up for me? Pardon me? Would you take one of my cards and write that up for me? Okay. And, you know, what you can remember and if any of the names. So I don't know if any of them are still right. living down in the Otumwa area. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that was. If you can remember any names, write them down and I'll try to find out. So, yeah, that was one of the things with the Rosies. So many of them, the war ended and goodbye. Thank you. I'm not sure they even got the thank you sometimes. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, my mother worked down at the packing plant and I was wondering if she was called. Rosie, Pretty much any of the women that worked during the war were roses. She packed bacon. Yeah, yeah. 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 and that's, that, that was, was that? the department I worked in. Really? So, yeah, so I may have met her. Oh. <laughs> so was the bacon going to Europe? What? Was the bacon going to the soldiers? Or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So, I again, I'd like it. you to take a card and write me whatever you can. You know? Okay. So, and anybody else or? Let Marion know. So, <laughs> yeah. Also, I just thought of it. I finally remembered this. My dad had a ring that he brought back from Europe, and a uh, German prisoner of war made that for him. Really? In Austria. 
Okay. And uh, I believe my brother has it now. Yeah. That's so. cool. And like I say, I think there's more stuff out there than, mm -hmm. and you know, if you ever want to get it out in the family, if it gets to that stage, any of these museums or the Blue Star Museum in Des Moines would love to have it. So, anything else? I have books. If you're interested, this is my last trip here for Christmas, so do your Christmas shopping. <laughs> Thank you.